Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25-year speaking industry veteran Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report, Three Key Things Entrepreneurs Must Master to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. To pick up your copy, go to breadridgeway.com forward slash freebie. Welcome to the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway, where you'll learn the keys to building a profitable speaking business from speaking industry pros. Each week, we interview a great guest who will share his or her speaking journey, identify what their keys to success have been, and highlight some critical mistakes they've made along the way that you'll want to avoid. Be sure to visit our website at spotlightonspeaking.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, sit back, tune in, and get ready to meet this week's guest. We will have about a 15-second pause somewhere near the middle where I will be inserting the commercial later. And I do want to alert you, this episode will not release for three or four months. So I'm I'm well ahead of the game on, on recording. So don't mention anything specific that's timely because... It'll probably be passed before we actually get the episode out there. So no, I usually don't. And and Nora, just let you know on our end, um, once it is up, we'll probably just put it into the social media rotation. So it'll pop up on my feed every two months or so as yeah. an ongoing about, resource for people. About a week before it goes live, I will send you an email notifying you of that. And then the day of, I'll send you some graphics and other stuff you can use to promote it by social media or whatever you want. Terrific. To do. All right. So let's get rocking and rolling here. All right. We are recording, we're split screen, everything looks good, all right. Hello again, and welcome to another episode of the Spotlight on Speaking show with Brett Ridgway. I am the aforementioned Brett, and I am so excited to have my guest today, Samantha Bennett. Now, what do we know about Samantha? Well, originally from Chicago, Samantha Bennett is a writer, speaker, actor, teacher, and creativity, productivity specialist, and the author of the best-selling Get It Done, from Procrastination to Creative Genius, in 15 minutes a day, which Seth Godin called an instant classic, essential read for anyone who wants to make a ruckus. Her latest bestseller is Start Right Where You Are, How Little Changes Can Make a Big Difference for Overwhelmed Procrastinators, Frustrated Overachievers, and Recovering Perfectionists. That's a mouthful and a half. I know, right? <laughs> she is the creator of the Organized Artist Company dedicated to helping tens of thousands of creative people get unstuck, helping them to focus and move forward on their goals. Sam has also written the script for the hit musical in a booth at Chasen's. Is that how you say that, Sam? That's right. Mm -hmm. Chasen's and is working on her latest book about overwhelm due out in spring of 2024. Mm -hmm. She's an award-winning marketing expert, having spent 15 years as a personal branding specialist for Sam Christensen Studios and has been honored as an ultimate marketer finalist at InfusionCon. She's also a Keep Certified Consultant and Reseller. Recently, she has become a top instructor on LinkedIn Learning with over a million learners worldwide. Welcome, Sam Bennett, to the Spotlight on Speaking Show. Thank you so much, Brett. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Well, I'm excited to have you here today, Sam. So the first question I have to ask you is, are you creating a ruckus? I try to create a ruckus almost everywhere I go. <laughs> It's sometimes unintentional, but there, you know, nevertheless, the ruckus is there to be rucked. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm particularly about intrigued by the LinkedIn learning platform. So maybe we'll dive into that a little bit later on and how that can benefit speakers for getting their message out there, certainly. But Huge, I want right. to talk a little bit first about your speaking journey. So in my mind, there are three primary types of speakers, keynote speakers, platform sellers, and then people I call business builder speakers. So they're, you know, they're a chiropractor or whatever, and they're just speaking to build awareness of their business in their local community. Mm -hmm. So which type of speaker do you consider yourself and why do you like to play in that arena the best? I would consider myself more of a keynote speaker. Um, I've done sell from the stage before. I've done my own three-day events before um, and I enjoy that, but I so like working with high level ideas and then giving people very practical ways to implement them. So if I can start to change people's minds about their time management, about their productivity and about their own creativity, I love that opportunity. All right, so as a keynoter, do you speak primarily to corporations or associations or some other type of group? 
Um, some of each. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of corporations, um, some educational institutions, some sometimes just inside departments, um, uh, and then sometimes yeah for associations or conferences. A lot of conferences. How did you get into this speaking game in the first place, Sam? <laughs> Uh, well, I like I said in my bio, I started out as an actor. I was one of those kids who went to theater camp and, you know, somebody asked me once the first show I remember doing, and I said, I remember doing a production of Stone Soup when I was in kindergarten, you know, that old folktale, Stone Soup, right? And um, my mother happened to be nearby when somebody asked me this and she said, oh, Sam, she says, you didn't do it. She goes, you produced it. You made them do it. You brought in the costumes, you brought in the script and you made them do it. Now, I was four. I'm not exactly sure how I knew what a play was even, but I learned to read really early. And I think it's a very common thing when you love story and you love reading, you love stories. It's a pretty short step from, oh, I'm really loving reading this story to, oh, I want to share this story. I want to speak this story. I want to share the story with a, with a room, with a stage, with an audience, with the world. Um, so that was my life. I, I, you know, worked hard in the theater and on television and Chicago and then later in Los Angeles. So getting up in front of people and talking was never hard. And I spent a lot of my career working in improvisation. So, um, you know, by the time you've done a couple hundred thousand hours of that, there's almost nothing that can happen on a stage that's going to freak me out. <laughs> okay. um, I've, I've had so many people tell me that improv is a great way to sharpen up your skills as a speaker and, and you should take advantage of that opportunity should it ever present itself? A hundred percent. Or even if you're just looking to sort of liven up your life a little bit. I mean, it's everything you need to know about life. You will learn doing improvisation. And the people who are attracted to improvisation, both performing it, learning it, teaching it, are some of the loveliest people in the world. So I really, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Find your local improv studio. There's probably a class at your local community college and just jump on in there. It's so much fun. All right. So how do you go from stage actor and involved in the theater to actually speaking as a profession? So I started this business originally called the Organized Artist Company and um, really just focused on helping highly creative people get moving on the projects that matter. You know, because like all of us, you get everything done for everybody else all day. But that one thing that, you know, would really make a difference to you or your family or your community is somehow still sitting in a drawer right? Somehow every day you don't quite get to it. So I just got really interested in how do creative people make decisions? You know, how do you know which project to pick? How do you know how to move forward on it when there's a million things you could do? You know, should you have a podcast? Should you have a speaking career? Should you stand on the street corner with a sandwich board? Like, what do you do? Um, and I started teaching that class in a church basement in Van Nuys to like 11 people and feeling really shy about it. And then it grew and grew. And then I started teaching online um, on instant teleseminar. Remember that back in the day? Oh, sure. Um, and, uh, uh, and it wasn't very long before I started getting asked to, asked to speak. People would you know, take my class and say, hey, would you come speak at my business? Or would you come talk at my church? Or would you come uh, you know, to our, uh, I remember having a conversation with a banker and uh, I was trying to get a loan for my business, which I didn't get, but I did get a speaking gig at the Montecito Country Club, which was great. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the key things that every speaker who wants to get into this game wants to know is how to get more gigs. So do you use speaker bureaus? How do you go about typically finding speaking engagements? I have to say, and I, I they tend to find me. They tend to find me. People hear me on a podcast. Or, nice problem to have. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, um, I will say this LinkedIn learning thing has been huge. And um, what happened there is right right at the beginning of the pandemic, I had um, some guys reach out to me on, on LinkedIn um, where I have never paid any attention whatsoever. I mean, I've always had a profile up because you do. But I was like, those people don't need me. They have jobs. <laughs> but uh, they said, hey, you know, we've seen your, you know, some of your videos and your YouTube channel, and we think you're really great. Have you ever thought about selling your trainings to places like LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, lynda.com, any place like that? And I was like, well, we can talk about it. And so we ended up creating a bunch of scripts together. And then I would go to their production facility in Santa Barbara and we'd film them and they would then they would do all the post and huh. then they would sell it to, like I said, LinkedIn, predominantly LinkedIn Learning, but also some other platforms as well. 
And I now have over, I've, I think 11 courses on there now. There's a couple more in the pipeline coming and over a million learners all over the world. And I get paid some from, I get some royalties from that, but it's not, you know, it's not huge money, but what it does do is give me this massive amount of credibility. So I have companies reach out to me and say, Hey, you know, we've seen your trainings. We know we love you. Can you come and, you know, keynote for this, or can you do a virtual keynote for that? Or Harvard extension reached out to me. And I was like, I'm sorry. Did you say Harvard? <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> so, um, that's just been delightful. That's brought a lot of really fun opportunities. So I'm not that familiar with LinkedIn learning. So how can the average speaker take advantage of that opportunity? Because it sounds like you needed to be near their studio in order to make that happen. No, they fly people in from all over um, to, to film. Okay. And uh, uh, LinkedIn learning used to be a company called lynda.com. Lynda.com um, pioneered the online learning industry before there was such a thing. And, uh, and then they eventually got bought by LinkedIn and then LinkedIn got bought by Microsoft. So it went from being a very successful, but um, family owned business to being a grillion dollar business. Sure. All right. So you've been down this path. You consider yourself primarily a keynoter. So what would your words of advice be to an aspiring speaker that is thinking about keynoting to have the greatest of success? Take an improv class. <laughs> um, just to, All right, just I'll to, give you that one. But I'm going to ask you for just to circle more back. Again. Just to circle back. Take an improv <laughs> class. Um, I think to have the greatest chance of success. I mean, you really don't want to be boring. <laughs> And that may seem a little self-evident, but it's shocking how many speakers are really, really dull. And so I think it's important to remember that everything is entertainment. Everything is entertainment. Now, I don't mean that everything has to be funny or jokey, not at all, not at all. In fact, I think mostly the comedy should be left to the professionals. Even I don't try to be, be particularly funny in my, in my talks. Um, but you need to be emotionally engaging. You need to appeal to people's senses. You need to speak to their belly and their heart and let them know that, you know, we're all just human beings doing the best we can. And whatever your area of expertise is that you are there to bring some lightness, some inspiration, some illumination to to your world, to your topic and to their world. I once had a teacher, I was trying to do a double major in theater and education and um, I had an education teacher say that it was the instructor's job to romance the, your students into your subject, which I think is a wonderful way to say that, to romance your students into your subject. So to romance your audience in whatever way you like to romance. Like some people like to romance by being funny and making jokes. Some people like to romance by, you know, speaking very softly and being very intimate with people. And some people like to romance by, um, you know, cracking a whip, you know, <laughs> and being, you know, uh, really energetic and go get them. So whatever your style is, lean into that and, and really just try to connect on a human level with your audience. So Sam, let's go down that path a little bit more. What do you do to build rapport with your audiences? I mean, is it more interactivity? Is it more storytelling i mean how are you making that connection work for you best i love interactivity i really don't care for one-way communication this whole thing of i'm going to stand up on stage and talk and you're going to sit in the audience and take notes i think is a terrible way to learn it's a terrible way to teach it's wildly unsuccessful for almost everyone um so the more i can get them writing out a worksheet turning to their neighbor standing up sitting down running or anything I can do to get them because they're going to forget everything I say. They're going to forget every single thing I say, except maybe a really great teaching story, mm -hmm. but they are more like, but they might remember what they say and they might remember what they do. So huh. the more I can get them doing the better. And I let them know this right away when I teach online um, and in person, 
and especially in corporate, because this can get me a lot of raised eyebrows, but I start with a breathing exercise. I get up in front of everybody. I look around the room. I try to make some eye contact. I tell them all they look really great today, which they do. <laughs> Generally, people are lovely. So, wow, you all look terrific. And they sort of smile at me and I go, I want to start by doing a little bit of breathing. Um, we're just going to inhale for a count of four, hold for a count of seven, exhale for a count of eight. We'll do that three times. I'll count us through it. If you want to ignore it, you're welcome to, but it's breathing, which you have to do anyway. And most people find this to be a very pleasant experience. So I do that. I do that counted breathing and it helps center me and plug me in, um, whether I'm live in front of them or especially, you know, when I'm here in my office and, you know, I've been doing 57 things and I'm like, oh, right, I need to teach. I need to be present right now. So that breathing brings me into the present moment. It brings them into the present moment, reminds them they have a body, you know, <laughs> and, um, uh, and then move and, and sort of creates a mood and an atmosphere right away. Mm -hmm. And then we're off, you know. Okay. So aside from that, any, any other tips for success that you would want to pass along? Yeah. I, um, I was doing a, a training not too long ago uh, for the Screen Actors Guild. You'd think that everyone there would know this, but I was talking about how to be more engaging online <coughs> when you're teaching and speaking online. And I said, look, here's me sort of, you know, you have to train yourself to not look at your own face, right? Because when we're on Zoom, I can, now you can hide your self view, which that works for some people. Um, but so this is me sort of looking at the screen and kind of looking at myself. And here's me sort of looking at the camera and here's me looking through the camera. I'm getting scared. <laughs> See, everyone's like, oh my God, how did you do that? Right? So here's me looking at the screen. Here's me looking at the camera. Here's me looking through the camera. Mm -hmm. So if you have a point you want to make, look through the camera. All right, well, great advice. So what all do you do differently for a virtual presentation compared to an in-person presentation? Um, I mean, the real problem with virtual is we just can't see each other. I can't see your whole body. I can't see your feet. I can't see you fidget. I can't see you roll your eyes and look mm -hmm. at the person sitting next to you going, oh my God, this woman's terrible. You know, like I can't, I don't get to see any of that. So, um, and I can't control the rest of your environment. I don't know if your dog's barking or your kid's sick or it's raining where you are and you're worried about the garage leaking, you know, so I have to try to be sort of especially engaging to make sure that I can keep your attention from all the other windows opening. For a long time, Zoom would track your attentiveness rating. I don't think they do it anymore, um, but I was always very proud because they it would see if people clicked over to other windows while you were teaching uh -huh. or talking. And I was very proud of my 100% attentiveness rating. <laughs> um, so whatever you gotta do to keep them hooked in. And that's, that usually involves a lot of questions. Um, yeah, like I said, interactivity, exercises, making them do things. Um, and remember, you need to train them how to behave. So if you want them to respond to you, you need to start that right away, huh. right? This is something we learned at the Second City doing improvisation. If you wanna ask the audience for suggestions, you can't do 20 minutes of sketches and then ask them for suggestions because you've trained them to sit back and not really, you know, and not engage. Huh. So if you're gonna, if you want to and froing, if you want suggestions, if you want their input, then you've gotta get them talking right away or entering into the chat right away or however it is you want them to behave. All right. Well, such great advice. I do have a couple other questions I want to ask you, Sam, but before we do, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Are you a business owner or entrepreneur who's had great success in the business world? And now you want to launch a speaking career to share your message with the world. If that's you, then listen up. 25 year speaking industry veteran, Brett Ridgway has released his latest special report three key things entrepreneurs must master to build a profitable speaking business. To pick up your copy, go to breadridgeway.com forward slash freebie. And we are back with the Spotlight on the Speaking Show. My guest this week is Sam Bennett. So one of my favorite questions to ask my guest, Sam, is, all right, bury your soul a little bit here. Don't be embarrassed, but share something maybe that you made a mistake along the way in your speaking career it was a bit embarrassing at the time, but there was a lesson learned from it that you could pass along to the aspiring speaker so that hopefully they don't make that same mistake. Mm. Um, yeah, one of the worst... I mean, so I get the, the, the end of the story, the advice I would give is um, get rid of disruptors right away. Okay. Um, in my experience... 
99.999% of people are lovely. And even if they don't care about you or what you're saying, they will still sit there quietly and not make a fuss. But every once in a while, you get somebody who really wants to pick a fight. And um, who knows why? They're doing it for the greater glory of themselves. They're having an issue. They have an issue with, with me, with you. I don't know. Um, but it was my own three-day event. And uh, we'd had, uh, I'd had a sort of a surprise for them that morning. And when we broke for lunch, you know, I was back in my green room and my team started coming to me saying like, there's some real rumblings about the, what had happened that morning. And people are saying they felt blindsided and this and that. And I was like, well, okay. Um, and there was sort of this question of like, is it better to address it? Is it better to not address it? You know, how, how, how loud are these rumblings? <laughs> and uh, we decided, okay, I'll, I'll address it. And um, not in a, way of apologizing or making excuses, but just saying, look, I want to acknowledge that there's some difference of opinion about what we did. Um, I thought I was creating a pleasant surprise. You felt blindsided. Same thing. Blindsided surprised is the same thing. It's just having two, you know, one person likes it and one person doesn't. Um, and the two sort of, there were two women together who were not happy with what had happened. And they got up to the mic and started just lambasting me, like just calling into question everything I had done and uh. criticizing me even for things I hadn't done. Like, well, at least you didn't say this and this and this and this. And I'm like, right, I didn't say that. That's not what, <laughs> like, uh. <laughs> correct. I did not say that. Um, so how'd you handle this? So I stood there, I just, I. so this is again where theater training really comes in handy. I just stood very firmly and squarely where I was. I sort of held space for them with my arms a little bit. Right, so it was just me and them. They were at the mic, you know, the mm -hmm. participant mic, and just said, "Okay, I hear you. I understand. Okay, thank you." And as they started to go on, I said, "Look, this is really getting outside the scope of of what we're here to do. I'm happy to talk about this with you privately, um, but we're, I'm going to close out this part of the conversation now." And uh, we took a break. And I stayed in the room during that break. I didn't, usually I'm very quick to upset myself because I need to, you know, gather myself and let them have time to talk. But that, at that point, it's like, no, no, I need to be in the room. So I stayed in the room and um, <laughs> it was kind of delightful. I had a lot of people come up to me during the break and be like, well, I thought they were completely wrong. I don't know what they were saying. I, I thought it was delight. I love that surprise. That was great. Like, okay, thank you very much. That's nice to hear. And then, and this just laid me out. This one woman comes up to me and she starts to speak and immediately starts crying. I'm like, are you okay? And she said, yeah. She says, I just want to tell you, she goes, I have lived my entire life terrified of criticism, terrified. She said, and to watch you just handle that and be so gracious and polite and firm with them. She goes, it's like, it's just changed everything for me. And I was like, okay, well, if I had to go through that so you could get this, then that was there worth you it. There you go. Yeah. That was worth so it. So did you ask those people to leave the event? But I really, they had, we did ask them to leave or we invited them to leave, I think. Um, and I think one of them did and one of them didn't. Um, but they there had been signs of trouble the day before. And if I'd had my wits together, I probably should have come to them earlier and said, I don't think this is the right place for you. I don't think you're going to get what you want here. Um, yeah. I should have just given them a refund and showed them the door. Yeah, from my experience, your best bet is to get rid of the disruptors as quickly as possible. Give them their money back, say thank you very much, and have a great life. But you know, exactly. they, will bring, they will drag your whole event down if you allow them to continue. So, oh my gosh, yeah, it was rough. It was rough. Um, but you know, like with every mistake, like with everything that goes sideways, you have an opportunity to show people who you really are. Sure. All right, Sam, so I'd like to take a couple minutes now and give you an opportunity to tell a little bit people more about what all you do, how you can help aspiring speakers, and how they can get involved in your world if they so choose to do so. Yeah, the um, the number one thing I'd say is to join my email list. I do almost all of my marketing and communication via email, um, so just hop over to therealsambennett.com, and I'm sure there's some pop-up or opt-in or something there that will invite you into the email list. And especially you might enjoy seeing how I handle email and, and, and what I do with it. I'm a little bit of a 
in, in, a certain, in a certain small pond, I'm a kind of an email expert. And um, I think about it, I think maybe a little bit differently than most people do. So uh, I'd love to invite you onto my email list. And obviously you can unsubscribe anytime. Um, and I think we have an opt-in that's actually my ebook of how to write emails people want to read, which can be sort of a fun resource for you. Well, um, I mean, otherwise you can. Hmm? I'm sorry. I got. I just got to say, the email is so critical for any speaker to build that rapport and nurture their audience. So, oh. I would highly encourage you to take advantage of Sam's offer about her ebook on email because the more effective you can make yours, the far better off you will be over time. So. 100%. Back, back to you, Sam. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Really learning how to be engaging right away. I mean, that, that's how this whole thing with the LinkedIn Learning Guys, you know, the with that production company started is they wrote me a really great little note. Mm -hmm. And if they had written, not written such a good, I mean, I get pinged every day. I'm sure you do too. Hi, we help graduates by authors and speakers, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you don't know me. Delete, 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 delete. Hey, yep. I want to know what's your number one goal this year? Delete, 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 delete. Um, but when you can do it well, you can really do well. <laughs> so I recommend it's a skill worth learning. Um, otherwise, yeah, you can find me on all the socials is the real Sam Bennett. So I'd love to see you wherever you want to be seen. All right, super. Well, I want to thank Sam so much for joining me today on the Spotlight on a Speaker Show with Brett Ridgway. Great advice is always on the show. You know, this is another one of those listen to it again episodes, guys, because there's a lot of pearls here that you can really apply to helping develop your own speaking career. But as always, I wish you the greatest of success in all that you do. If you haven't been to the Spotlight on Speaking show website, spotlightonspeaking.com, by all means, get over there and sign up by your favorite service. Be notified of upcoming episodes. And as always, I wish you the greatest success in all that you do. And may this be your greatest year yet. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. This has been the Spotlight on Speaking Show with Brett Ridgway. Be sure to join us every week as we interview speaking industry pros and have them share their best tips for building a profitable speaking business. Until next week, thank you for tuning in and remember to visit our website at spotlightonspeaking.com so you can enjoy even more great episodes like this one. While you're here, be sure to subscribe via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Spotlight on Speaking show. Until then, our sincere best wishes to you for the greatest of success as you work to build your own profitable speaking business.